Hey, Phil here from Radio.co, and in this webinar, I'm going to demonstrate, educate, and prove just how quickly and easily you can get your very own internet radio station on air with Radio.co. Now, each day I'm chatting with both beginners and broadcasting veterans alike to showcase surprising how little time and effort can go into at least getting your station up and running. In fact, you can begin broadcasting with us in literally minutes is a particular statement that I like referring to in my conversations. Now, understandably, that claim is occasionally thrown into question. After all, can you honestly say, Phil, that an internet radio station can be launched in mere minutes, even for someone completely inexperienced when it comes to broadcasting and technology? Honestly, yes. Yes, I can say that. Which brings us to this webinar today, where I'm going to show you that when you're ready to take that leap into radio station ownership, you can broadcast to the world in under 30 minutes. Now, it's worth pointing out that this webinar is primarily aimed at beginners or those in need of a little refresher. So I'll cover basic equipment, first of all, to get you started, as well as some notable names of kit you may have heard of, the first basic steps to take within Radio.co to begin effortlessly broadcasting, and then finishing off with a few caveats, extra information, and some frequently asked questions. Think of it like an idiot-proof crash course on basic internet broadcasting, if you will. Now, regardless of whether you are a complete beginner or an active broadcaster, I'm sure you have some questions and concerns of your own. Now, as this webinar has been pre-recorded, please write any questions in the comments below of wherever you're watching this, or alternatively, you can email them directly to me via studio at radio.co. Now, without further ado, let's set up our internet radio station. So, part one, basic equipment. And I know what you're thinking, what on earth do I need? Well, truth be told, you need very little equipment to at least get started, which I'm sure is a huge relief considering just how many different types and brands of equipment your Google search may have found already. So, what I'm gonna put place here is, what exactly do you need? Well, first things first, you need a computer. Of course, it sounds obvious, but people say, you know, can I broadcast through a mobile phone or a tablet? And yes, you can with a few caveats, but we always prefer and recommend using a computer or a laptop. Doesn't matter whether you are Windows or Mac, it's whatever you find most comfortable. Broadcasting, and particularly with Radio.co, works with both. I personally use a Windows computer. Now, a question I do get asked a lot is, I have a Chromebook, can I use that? Yes and no. For internet broadcasting, you can use a Chromebook to use our Radio.co software. So, you know, managing content, building shows, just generally running in automation. If you wanted to broadcast live, however, the additional software you need for broadcasting live, such as an encoder, uh, that, uh, you know, a, a word you may have heard thrown around, um, as far as we're aware, they are only compatible with Windows and Mac, or there are some also that are compatible with iOS, but nothing at the moment for Chrome OS. So. If you're wanting to do live broadcasting, it's always recommended to use a Windows or a Mac computer. And what computer you need is entirely up to you. Radio.co, again, is a cloud-based platform. So what that means for you is it doesn't actually run off your computer power. It runs off your internet primarily and our servers. So because of that, you only really need an average everyday powered computer, truth be told. So, uh, you know, I've got a fancy one, but that's just because I use it every day for work. If you've got one that's gathering dust, um, you know, as long as it's got at least maybe Windows 7, 8, I don't know which ones they come, as long as it boots up at a good enough speed and you've got uh, plenty of USB ports for equipment, that should be all that you need. As, yeah, as long as it's not taking a day to load, yeah, you'll be absolutely fine. So just an average everyday powered Windows or Mac computer. So that's the first thing. Um, you, of course, need internet. Um, if you are broadcasting live, we always recommend having at least an upload speed of two megabytes per second, which is actually reasonably quite a low bar to set. Obviously, the greater the speed, the more reliable it is, then you know, obviously the better success at broadcasting you'll have. But if your station is in automation, whether that's primarily or exclusively, you don't actually need internet at all unless you are uploading content and programming your shows. Radio.co actually powers the station for you, so even if you lost internet power, your station will still continue broadcasting. So, computer, check. Internet connection, check. Now, as for kit, I've got a lot here and I'm going to go through all of it, so, but the only one you really need, I'd say that is 
essential, and that's only if you plan to speak on, uh, on air, is a microphone, such as, first of all, this, a USB powered microphone. And this one specifically is the Rode NT USB Mini. Now, I personally had the original, the, the, the bigger brother of this microphone, just a regular NT-USB. So I can personally vouch for this particular model, um, or at least this variation of it. And this is a USB-powered microphone, which, as I suggest, you simply plug it into your computer and away you go. You usually don't need any additional drivers or anything to really power it. Just plug it in and go. Uh, Rode in particular, we have reviewed an awful lot of kit from them, so they do come highly recommended. Um, this will probably set you back, it's around $100 to $120 pounds. Um, and that's kind of the benchmark I always recommend um, going for when it comes to buying a microphone. Spending at least you know, upwards of $80, 80 pounds for a good quality microphone. Doesn't matter how uh, funny you are, doesn't matter how professional you are, doesn't matter how really hot your uh, content is, if you sound terrible, no one's going to keep listening. So spend a good amount of money and 80 to 100 pounds is a good benchmark to set yourself. So like I said, this is a USB powered microphone. There are tons of others available like Rode, Shaw, Blue, like the Blue Yeti in particular, you may have heard of. A lot of people use that for streaming and podcasting. Behringer, another very, very popular piece of uh, 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 equipment uh, manufacturers. Uh, there are tons and tons of available and we review an awful lot. So if you want to see our recommendations, you'll find them on our website. But uh, yeah, a USB powered microphone, you don't need anything else, talk into it, broadcast live, perfect, you are done. Now the other type of microphone you may have heard is an XLR microphone. And that's what one of these are. This is a Shure SM7B and it's actually my microphone of choice. Um, this set me back about 300 pounds I think when I bought it originally. So it is quite a high end microphone. There's no need to go mad and buy something this expensive right from the off. But what an XLR microphone is, is unlike a USB connection which plugs into your computer, these microphones use an XLR cable and therefore an XLR device to connect it to. Uh, and this is one of these, an XLR cable, very simple. A very, a very, albeit very, very small one. It's a bit like a garrot wire, this one. Um, but uh, yeah, this is specifically a very, very tiny XLR cable. Um, now, to power an XLR microphone, you are going to need to connect it to a XLR compatible device like a mixer or an audio interface as we've got here. Um, between using a USB and an XLR, it all comes down to a personal preference. You can get some really, really high quality, fantastic USB microphones like the Rode NT USB Mini there. But some people prefer to use the XLR microphone because arguably there's a lot more going on in it. It's a bit more of a powerful microphone, capable of doing so much more. And the fact that you can plug that into a device that allows you to manually change your uh, you know, your levels, your gain, your faders and everything. So just to have a bit more creative control and freedom over the sound of your vocals, maybe the reason why you go for an XLR microphone instead. So as I say, this is the Shure SM7B, probably a bit more of an industry standard microphone. You might find that littered throughout studios all over the world. But another one that's kind of creeping slightly behind it, again, Rode, is the Rode PodMic, which is one that we've used a lot uh, in some of our videos. It comes, again, very critically acclaimed. And this is a very nicely priced uh, entry-level LXR uh, XLR microphone, retailing for around $100. I think when it was released, it was about $90, something like that. Uh, again, this works off an XLR cable, and it's a very, very good microphone. There is, of course, a difference in sound quality and clarity comparing it to something that is three times the price. But if you want a really crystal clear, clean sound for uh, beginning your broadcasting, then you can't go wrong with a Rode pod mic. Uh, of course, there are all the variations. This is a Movo microphone, a bit more on the cheaper end of professional XLR microphone. Um, again, Shure, Behringer, Aston, Universal Audio, there's a, a, an onslaught of incredible microphones out there. Just find one that you think fits you and check out our reviews if you want to know how they sound. Now, as I say, to connect these and to actually use an XLR microphone, you will need something along the lines of this, a mixer or an audio interface. Now, again, another question I get asked is, what's the difference? Do I need both? Which one do I go for? Again, it's a personal preference. As you can see, these, are audio interfaces, the Focusrite Vocaster 2 and 
It's uh, the thing that it wiped out very, sh uh, you know, not too long ago when this was released. It's um, the the one that came before it, the Focusrite Scarlet 2i2. I was going to say predecessor, but that's the wrong one. I can't remember the other one. Rowan, what's the other word for the opposite of predecessor? Ancestor. Ancestor, and this is the successor to it. There we go, I got there eventually. <laughs> so, uh, so what an audio interface is, is it's basically a slimmed down portable mixer. It has a lot less functionality than a mixer, but that's often better for you depending on what your setup is. So these are mixers. We've got a, a Behringer Zenix USB mixer, and we've also got the brand new awesome, again, Rode. Again, we say we, we do a lot of uh, reviews for them. Uh, this is the Rode uh, Pro, uh, Rodecaster Pro 2, brand new. Now, as you can see, these mixers here, they have a range of different faders and functionalities and buttons, whilst these don't. A mixer arguably gives you a lot more, I guess, freedom to refine the sound of your vocals and any audio source going through it. So as you can see with this Behringer Zenix, we've got a lot of individual knobs. Some of them will have individual faders like this. Just allows you to change the EQ, um, a lot of the gain, individual sounds to really get a sound that you're happy with. And you know, if you've got plenty of inputs to plug in, uh, speakers, additional microphones, uh, different audio sources like mobile phones, for example. That's what a mix is good for. Lots of different inputs to allow you to manually adjust all of them. This in particular one is uh, on the cheaper end. Always make sure it's a USB powered mixer or interface. You'll find it a heck of a lot easier to use. Um, so they all come in different shapes and sizes, different uh, amounts of ports, um, you know, connections and all things like that. So that will do you really well for quite a portable, albeit very heavy mixer. Or you can get something like a Rodecaster Pro or the Rodecaster Pro 2 here, which also works as a digital console, just to add even more confusion into the mix. That basically just means um, it's more than just a mixer, you can actually record content directly into it. So you can see the levels are going, it's got a little computer screen on it, and I can record stuff onto a micro SD. Uh, now, because of that, it's got a huge amount of functionality. These are on the topper end of a, uh, a good USB mixer, you know, about six, seven hundred dollars or so, something like this. And mixers come in lots of shapes and sizes and prices. Some custom ones, we've got like an Axia IQ console uh, in the office, and that was a, a custom made, I think about three thousand dollars, something like that. So they do come, uh, maybe even more, um, but they do come in a, a wide variety of usage. So if you are looking to have individual inputs or the ability to actually change individual inputs like here, then a mixer is definitely the way to go. You can get a more refined sound that you're happy with. If you literally just want to plug in and go, an audio interface is the way to go. They are cheaper, smaller, lighter, portable. Uh, that's a Daft Punk song, isn't it? Um, but here we also have this, which is brand new, the uh, Focusrite Vocaster 2. Now this is kind of part of the new evolution of what audio interfaces are like. Focusrite Scarlet 2i2 has been a staple part of studios and broadcasters for the last 10 years, and this is now wiped out completely. Um, now the Focusrite 2i2, really high quality clarity of sound, but it pretty much just is a way of working your XLR microphone. This opens up the possibilities to do a lot more. It has the ability to plug in one or two inputs like here. Also allows you to plug in your speakers, again for monitoring. But it also allows you to connect cables in for cameras. So if you want to incorporate video in your broadcasting, this will mean it's recording the audio directly into your camera. So there's no need for syncing. It will do it automatically. Um, it's also Bluetooth functionality. So if you have audio, uh, like trailers or audio files, ads, or just a caller you'd like to broadcast on air, connect it via Bluetooth and broadcast them on air. So this is kind of like the new the new generation of audio interfaces, things that are capable of doing so much more, similar to mixers, just in a more condensed, portable, really light way. So as I say, what interface or mixer you go for, which of the two, it's all down to you. If you want something that will do pretty much everything, you've got these brand new consoles. If you want something that allows you to do multiple inputs for a studio where you're gonna have lots of microphones, a mixer. If you just want you or maybe a duo to broadcast, uh, an audio interface is definitely the way to go. And again, popular brands, Focusrite, Rode, Behringer, they're just a small, small percentage of what's available. 
Now for some other doodads and things that you may want to consider, things like a good pair of headphones. These are the Rode NTH100s. I reviewed them not too long ago. Really great studio quality sound. When it comes to headphones, ideally you want them to both be comfortable and to give you a really accurate isolated sound. You want to be able to make sure you can hear yourself properly because that's likely how your audience are hearing you as well. So a nice closed back pair of headphones, like the, um, I said, the Rode NTH100s. Uh, the Bayer Dynamic DT770s are a popular pair that I have personally, which are really, really good closed back headphones. And again, so many brands do their own versions of it, but you know, even just a good 30 pound pair of Sony headphones, or you know, anything that you find comfortable and it's really closing around your ear and it's giving you a really good isolated sound. That's what you want. No need to necessarily break the bank with them. We've got this doodad here. Don't know why I'm going for my word of the day's doodad. Have it spread across there. Uh, so this doodad is a, um, a boom arm, or we've got a slight other variation of just simply a little mic stand here. Boom arms, mic stands, great for just, if you're like me and you talk a lot with your hands, this just allows you just to be more hands-free. Um, also means that if you're knocking the table, there's less chance of the uh, reverberations coming through to the microphone. Because again, I'm talking with my hands, sometimes they go plonk on the table. So this just means that even if it is wobbling, not too much sound is uh, coming into that. So boom arm, microphone stand, I'd say that's more essential than something to consider. Um, obviously cables, if it's an XLR microphone, you're going to need an XLR cable. These are incredibly cheap. Uh, again, only needed if you want an XLR microphone. Otherwise, USB cables for those microphones are always provided. If they're not, it's probably dodgy uh, or cheap. Uh, and uh, other things as well like this uh, is a pop shield. Simply meant to capture pops and plosives. So things from hard peas, a lot of, um, you know, especially when I talk about podcasting, obviously you can imagine how aggravating that is to hit with hard peas all the time. So pop shields are really good for that. Uh, again, these are really, really cheap. Um, you know, a lot of microphones will come with these as well. Um, I guess these are kind of like, pop shields or muffs in the industry, at least once upon a time. Uh, these are really good, again, for capturing a lot of those pops and plosives to stop them breaking through into the microphone, but there's no harm in doubling up. You know, it's, it's not gonna condense and cushion the sound too much. So things like that are always good. And that's really it for equipment. There is some advanced equipment that, you know, for a lot of microphones like the Shure SM7B, for example, is very sensitive. And um, what I mean by that is, um, it requires an awful lot of gain, so you're going to have to turn the gain way up to get a really good clear sound on that. Because of that, it means that there is no wiggle room to increase the sound of it. So you may want to use things called um, uh, so, uh, mic processors or preamps just to bring the power down a little bit. Um, but that's going into advanced kit um, uh, uh, situations. But really, for basic broadcasting, computer, internet, USB microphone or XLR with an accompanying desk if you want it and you are good to go. <sighs> right, so you're all plugged in, you're ready to rock and roll. Let's begin broadcasting. So as I say, you've plugged in, you've tested, tested, one, two, three, but where do you go from here? Well, right here is the answer to that. As part two, we're gonna be talking about broadcasting online through radio.co. Now, in a nutshell, by subscribing to Radio.co, you'll have all the essential software and online tools needed to begin broadcasting as soon as you're ready to. And what I mean by that is practically everything that you can expect to do from any typical radio station, such as scheduling shows, broadcasting live, tracking your audiences, and even putting your station into automation 24-7 if you wanted to. That, all that is what I mean. You know, you can literally begin broadcasting anytime you like from your own computer, from your own home, because we'll give you all the software and means to do that. Now, the Radio.co platform is capable of so much more beyond these mere basics, but right now I'm just gonna focus on the basics of the software to introduce you to the five key areas you should follow to begin broadcasting. These are uploading media, building playlists, scheduling playlists, going on air, and inviting people to listen. Yeah, that's five. Uh, for more guidance on everything else Radio.co can do beyond the basics, such as some of our more advanced creative and management tools like voice tracking or our news bulletin builder, then you can check out the tutorials for those individually through the Radio.co University or our help center at help.radio.co. Or if you want to, you can click here to check out my full pre-recorded demo. 
So what you should be able to see here is your radio.co dashboard. And if you're completely new to the radio.co platform, you get here by going to our pricing page, finding whichever of our five subscription plans you want, clicking on the start trial button, filling your details, and here we go, three minutes later, you're logged in and you should have a blank canvas that you know gives you all the creative freedom and control to really broadcast your very own station. And as I said there, I'm just gonna go through some of the basics for you so you can get up and running very, very quickly. There is so much more that this is capable of, but I'm not gonna uh, overwhelm you with too much things uh, right off the bat. So here we go, I'm on the platform. Now, the first thing that I advise you doing is actually uploading some content because what's the point of turning your station on air if there is nothing there to play? So let's go here. So I'm on the platform now, so I'm just gonna come to the add media button here, which is the right button right towards the top, the red button here, so click that. And what you should see is the option to drag and drop files into your browser, just simply drag and drop, or selecting your files there. Now you can upload anything you like as long as it is MP3 or AAC. That's if you've ever bought anything off iTunes, or you know, that's usually Apple's preferred um, uh, file format. But otherwise, MP3, I'm sure you've got a ton of them already. So once you've selected the files, you can upload your, uh, your media. I mean, you'll find them then in your media library. And to get there, click here on the left. And this is what you'll see. You'll see your media library. Now, if you remember earlier when I was talking about Radio.co during the equipment demonstration, I was mentioning how the platform is all cloud-based. And that still applies here when it comes to your content because you're actually uploading all of your media to your cloud-based uh, storage allowance. So it means regardless of what computer you log into your Radio.co account from or you know wherever you are in the world, you'll always find your media. So I've uploaded tracks, I think about two and a half thousand tracks on this particular account. As you scroll down, they are all there. And uh, you can see that a lot of these tracks have these brightly colored labels attached to them. They're what we call tags. What tags do is they just help you keep everything organized, simply. So if I'd uploaded a lot of, I don't know, 2000s R&B tracks, I might want to create a label for them so I know how many 2000s R&B tracks I have. So to do that, I'm gonna highlight a few tracks here. I know full well that these tracks I'm selecting are, couldn't be any further from uh, 2000s R&B. But here we go, I've highlighted them. Maybe one of them is. Uh, and come to the top here where it says add and create tag. And I'm going to type in something like that, 2000s R and B. You know, you can be as specific or as broad as you want. This is there to organize your content. So if I click add, it's created that label and it's attached it to those five tracks there. Once that tag has been created, I can then select any other tracks I want and just add that pre-created tag to it. So uh, yeah, literally type in whatever you want because it's there to help you. So we've uploaded media. We have categorized it. You know, it's not essential, but strongly recommended. That's step one. We've got content to play and we're almost ready to go. But we actually need to, you know, build some shows first. So to do that, I'm going to jump to the playlist section here. And in the most basic sense, anything that is not live. So when you are not doing a live show, but you want to broadcast something, that is always gonna be in the form of a playlist. So even if it's just one track that you want to play at a specific time, you put that track into a specific playlist and schedule it at that specific time. Um, you can see here, I've got a few generic playlists I've made already. I have a breakfast show, I have a Phil's Mix show, I have an R&B show, I have lots. But the one I am gonna be focusing on first is this one, this default playlist. Now, what this default playlist is, it's kind of like our secret weapon in a way. It's something that we cannot rave about enough. What this does is this actually has been built to help you create a 24 hour station. And it does that by automatically fading in when your station is on air, like so, and when you have nothing in your schedule. So, you know, you've got this 24 seven uh, canvas. You don't need to spend so much time and effort actually filling it with content every hour of every single day. Instead, you can rely on the default playlist to automatically fade in and fill it in for you. So make use of it. I know I have 70 tracks in here already. You will have none, of course. I mean, it's already included in your plan, but yours will be empty. So add tracks to it. So I recommend coming all the way to the pencil icon here, edit, clicking on that, and that will open up your 
uh, playlist builder. You can see mine's already populated with specific tracks. I've got tags I've popped in there and that allows the software to play tracks from your tags at random. So here, if I wanted a random jingle to play, I can, I don't really care which one it is, the software will pull it for me or a random Beatles or a random 90s track like so. But to add tracks yourself, you'll find all of your uploaded tracks within the tracks tab and any tracks you want to add in, click on the plus button and you'll see as soon as I do, it is jumping by default to the bottom of my playlist. And you should notice as well that every track I'm adding, the duration is adding up as well. So it's 5.15 at the moment, or just shy 5.16. And now a couple of tracks later, there you go, it's 5.31.12. So this will keep a live display so you know exactly how long this show is. Any tracks you add, they don't actually have to be added into a particular order because you can just drag them around with the mouse to change it. So you can see it's so, so simple to begin broadcasting. You know, any tracks you add, literally move any of them across. You add it in the exact same way you would expect to add tracks to any other playlist you may have used. Just move it across. So whether that is jingles, ads, uh, pre-recorded voice segments, an entire 60 minute long pre-recorded show, take that file, move it across. Simple as that. Um, as I mentioned about tags, you'll find them in the tags tab. Take any of those tags, move it across, and there we go, the software will play a track at random for you. It's also clever though, the software, it recognizes tracks it's played before within that tag. So even if you did rely on that tag quite a lot, it's actually going to make sure all of them play at least once before any are repeated. So it's really, really good. If you have at least the bronze plan, you'll have the ability to record live broadcasts that you do, and you'll find those recordings here to simply pop into your uh, uh, playlist to repeat. Uh, then I mentioned about voice tracking, one of our advanced features that just basically allows you to record um, uh, vocal segments up to 10 minutes in length directly into radio.co. And you, know, you can record as many as you like, move them across, and it gives off the impression there's a live host around your pre-recorded music show. I'm not going to go into those, of course, right now, but as I say, go to our help centre, help.radio.co, if you want to find more information about how they actually work. So that is almost the end of step two, building shows. The last thing to do is click save. Okay, now we're ready for step three, and that is actually creating and scheduling your shows. So let's move to the schedule, which is here. And this is what you'll be greeted with. You'll see the days of the week along the top, the time is now by the side. As I scroll down, you'll see what my particular station is doing. I have a live breakfast show every morning, a live evening show every evening, and a little uh, live show here at the weekends. Now the software will literally broadcast whatever it is you wanted to do. If it's a playlist, just decide what time you want that playlist to play. If it's a live show, decide how long or what time you want that DJ to go live. And as I mentioned, that default playlist has been built to automatically fade in any time there is a gap in your schedule, which is exactly what's happening here between 12 and six. You can see my station is on air, something's broadcasting, but it's blank. That's because that default playlist is fading it in. And it's also happening here between midnight and nine. So use that as much as you like. Some people, believe it or not, actually have 24 seven blank schedules and they just use that default playlist. But you're here to schedule a specific show. So allow me to do that. What you will do is, I mean, tell you what, I'm, to make it easier to illustrate, I'm gonna delete this event. So you can delete and edit events as you wish. I'm gonna delete this one here and start again. So here we go, right, I'm gonna schedule a show. I'm gonna do a show this afternoon, Friday afternoon, there we are, uh, two o'clock till four o'clock. So I'm gonna click on two and I'm gonna drag it down to four. There we go. Now I've scheduled the time of the event, but I just need to make sure all those details are right first of all. So what we got, start time, duration and end time. So starts at two, it's two hours, finishes at four. Great, that's exactly what I wanted. What days of the week is it broadcasting? Is it just today, just Friday? Or is it also gonna be two till four on Saturday or on Tuesday? Pick any day you like and the software will replicate it for you. So you don't have to keep coming in and scheduling every single day. So I'm gonna click all because I want it on all day, uh, sorry, every day, two till four. And the last thing you want to do is decide, is this going to be a reoccurring show on a weekly, monthly, even yearly basis? So if I knew two till four every day for at least the next six months, I can click repeat every week and put in a date within the next 
six months here. So I'm gonna do it till um, February. There you go, February 14th, there we go. I'm gonna do this show until Valentine's Day next year, lovely. Now the last thing you need to do is just confirm what type of show this is gonna be. So if I click on the advanced tab, advanced by name, not by nature, all this is doing is it's asking you what type of event this is gonna be. So two till four every day, every week for the next few months, is it gonna be a playlist, a live DJ or a live relay? Playlist, as the name suggests, if you click that, simply means you're gonna select a specific playlist that you've made. And at the moment, I'm gonna select this one. It's a Saturday afternoon, why not? Even though it is gonna be broadcasting each day, doesn't really matter for the purpose of this, but I can also click on this drop down menu and it will show me all the other shows I could potentially build. But for now, Saturday afternoon, that's what I want. So this means I'm gonna play the Saturday afternoon playlist two till four every day, like a maniac, uh, every week for the next six months. And if I'm happy with that, click create, give it a second or two, bosh, there we go. That's been scheduled for you starting from today, two till four, the Saturday afternoon playlist. Because the software is all cloud-based, it will do this show for you. Your computer doesn't need to be on. You don't need to monitor it. You don't need to press anything. None of that. You've told the software from two to four, you want this playlist to play. So as long as your station has been turned on, it will fade in and fade out. And that's all that's involved in doing something that is pre-recorded and automated. Just upload that file, uh, build a playlist, tell the software what time you want it to play. And for live shows, it's done in a very, very similar way. Let me zoom out. All you do is on the event type, you instead select live DJ. And very similarly to a playlist, all you do is you choose a specific host that you want to go live instead of a playlist. So you can invite people onto your account. Each of our subscriptions has a limit on how many people you can invite. Uh, for now, I'm gonna stick with Alan, but if I wanted to, I could select myself or I could select Rowan, you know, anyone who wants to go live. It's worth noting though, whoever you do select, they're the only one that can go live during that show. So, you know, there's no risk of people who shouldn't be going live taking over, you know, without you knowing. So Alan, he's gonna go live two till four. As I mentioned, you know, you can record live broadcasts. So I'm gonna record that show, great, and maybe upload it as a podcast for on-demand content. And I'm gonna update the event. I'm not gonna change it completely. I'm just gonna update everything um, here. Uh, and then what you should be able to see here now is two till four, live DJ, Alan. So that means the software knows that uh, you are logging in to go live, uh, or rather Alan is, uh, I've got that image from uh, Jurassic Park in my head, Alan. Alan. He's gonna be fading in and going live. Um, Roman's laughing because he's gonna put it in. Alan. Uh, <laughs> so we're gonna have got Alan, Alan. Alan going live two till four. Uh, if anyone else tries to log in like me, I can't go live, it's simple as that. Um, I've also got a backup playlist. So this is actually a playlist that you select from this menu here when you have chosen a live DJ and that will be the playlist that will fade in in the event of an emergency or technical issue like you disconnecting due to a power cut or you or your DJ being late to start the show. And you can see as well that recording has been enabled. And that's how you do something that's live, just similar to a playlist, tell the software who wants to go live and at what time and as long as they do connect and go live, they will do. Don't worry about connecting for a live broadcast right now. Again, that guide is available from our help center and it differs depending on whether you are a Windows or a Mac user. That's why I mentioned earlier about encoders. That's how you actually connect to go live. And then the final one is a live relay that basically allows you to broadcast a live feed from another online radio station. So again, Ryan Seacrest, great mate of mine, if he was willing to allow me to broadcast some of his content or my other good mate, Howard Stern, um, all they do is I just need to put the URL for their station into radio.co and whatever they're broadcasting at a time will also be replicated on my station. And that's everything to do with programming. That's a third stage done. That is actually telling the software what you want it to play and when you want it to play. Fourth stage, seems very, very obvious, but you need to turn your station on air. And to do that, simply here, you can come to the dashboard if you want, or you can just come to this little button here. So at the moment, you can see my station is on air, and that's just a button. So if I click on it now, it actually gives me the option to turn it off. So you can turn your station on and off if you want, but 
Broadly speaking, most people leave it on 24 seven because after all, it's us that are powering it for you. So keep it on if you want, turn it off if you like, but the only way people are gonna actually be able to listen to your station, again, is to turn your station on. So before you start sending out your listen links and your apps to people, turn the station on. <laughs> Don't know how tells me to repeat it, turn it on. Um, and yeah, this is where you do it from here. So that's fourth stage, turning your station on. So you've got content playing, you've scheduled some shows, you've turned it on ready for people to listen. How do people listen? There are a few different ways. This is the final step, step five, getting people to listen, or rather inviting people to listen. That's the more polite way. Uh, and you do that by coming to the listen tab, first of all here. And what you'll see is a unique URL for your station. This is automatically generated when you create the account. And what it does is it allows people to literally click on that and it opens up a browser tab on their computer or their smartphone permitted. You have the bronze plan for that. Um, but it just means they can simply listen to your station from nothing but a click. It's not the prettiest link on earth because it can be, uh, it's not uh, possible to customize it, but you can send that to people, post it on social media, click on it, listen, boom, nice and easy. You can also submit your station to what we call internet radio directories. They are places all over the internet that cater for specifically internet radio stations. And some of them like Streamer or TuneIn is another familiar one. Uh, this is millions of people using it on the regular. Uh, so if you want to submit to it, you create a profile on these directories, submit your URL, and you can invite people there to listen instead. Uh, we have, Again, we have guides on nearly 40 directories you can submit to, so it's definitely one worth that's uh, checking out. Of course, if you'd rather direct people to a website that you own, the way you do that is through web players. So if you have your own website, whether that's currently or in the future, you can build a player that displays artwork for your tracks or your shows, or your hosts, or branding for your station. It displays uh, track information, show information, something that's just basically visually appealing and you've told people to go to your website, which has a personal domain name, and there on the front page is your radio station. This honestly takes about 20 seconds to create. It just asks you through the add play button, what shape, size, colors, images, and you're ready to rock. And all you do is you click on this copy embed code and paste that onto your website. And then the final ways, well, well not ultimately the final ways, but the final ways easily through radio.co at least, is through a series of add-ons. So you can actually build mobile phone apps exclusively through Radio.co, and these apps are white labeled, so they don't feature Radio.co branding, they don't have any other station on them, they are purely yours. Um, obviously you decide the name, logos, images, anything associated with it, and these can be added onto your account for an extra additional charge. Perfect for just increasing the efficiency and the accessibility of your station. As a, a big tip about people finding your station, Chances are they found out about your internet radio station while they're on their phone, probably a social media post that you did and they're on their phone about it. Why not capitalize on that potential listener who is currently on their phone? Studies have shown people are more likely to actually download an app rather than visit a website or do something else, even though downloading, finding, downloading an app arguably takes a bit more time to do. But consider having an app just because people are likely on their phones when they find out about your station anyway. And the fact that they can just come off it, listen to an app on their phone, that's it, they're more likely to. So just consider it um, as, as a way of increasing the accessibility of your station. And the same goes with Alexa skills, particularly here in the UK, over 50% of online radio is listened to through exclusively uh, smart speakers like Alexa skills or Google home devices. So consider just for an extra fee, making your station available at I was gonna say, you know, without, pe without people lifting their finger just at the drop of a hat, shout of a voice, that's it, they're listening to your station. And if a website is something you do want but you don't have it already, a website builder will do that. And that is the fifth stage, the fifth final step to take in this introductory journey, getting people to listen. And ideally what that's done is giving you a good basic introduction to what Radio.co can do. So you can see literally it's taken me what, 20 minutes, something like that, to show you the basic use of using it. So, you know, upload a few tracks, upload one track, turn your station on air, and that default playlist will just instantly give you a 24 seven stream. Fair enough of the same track looped, but you know, it's so, so easy and quick to get on air with radio.co. And you know, that's kind of it. So yeah, in about, you know, under 30 minutes, you can log in, upload, begin broadcasting, and immediately begin 
getting an audience. And there we have it. You're now on air broadcasting around the globe in, as promised, mere minutes. So that's all the basics covered, like using Radio.co, what equipment you may want to use. So if you wish, feel free to head to our Radio.co website right now, select one of our subscription plans, and create your own station just as quickly. Saying that, however, you may want to stick around for just a little bit longer. Again, it bears repeating, but what we've just covered there were the basics of broadcasting. So with what we've just discussed, you could very comfortably go on air immediately, as I've just shown you. Yet there are a couple of other things involved in broadcasting that you may want to investigate or familiarise yourself with first before you, know, you turn your station on air. Likewise, you may have a few questions in mind that still haven't been addressed yet. So hopefully within this final section of the webinar, that'll no longer be the case. In other information, caveats and other things I may want to cover. Part three. So first of all, licensing. Probably the most frequently asked question I do get on a daily basis is, do I need a license and where do I get it from? So ultimately, if you plan to play copyrighted material on your radio station, a license is strongly recommended. It just means that you know you've got the legal thumbs up, the green light to play pretty much whatever you like. Now, licensing entirely depends on what it is that you want to play or how you want to broadcast, where you want to broadcast, when you want to broadcast, how long you want to broadcast for. All these questions come down to you know, what license is right for you. Licensing, in all honesty, is a bit of a convoluted area and a lot of the information that you will be given is as clear as mud. And because we don't personally deal with it, there's only so much information that we can give because we don't want to give any inaccurate information. We do have a list of um, uh, the licensing organizations you want to go to, to speak with, to get an idea in licensing, and also just general advice on how you want to go about it. But again, generally speaking, you need to go to a licensing organization that is based in the country you are broadcasting from because that will allow you to broadcast in your country. So if you're based in America, there are a couple of organizations. They are ASCAP, BMI, SESAC, and Sound Exchange. There are four that you can work with, and all of them cover if you will, a different spectrum of the music industry. So depending on what you want to play, you made it a license with one of them or a few of them, but those sorts of questions can only be answered by actually getting in contact with these people. And every country has their own licensing organization. And as I say, we have a list of ones that we have found. Like if you're from the UK, Australia, most of Europe, uh, head to our um, radio.co website, go to the blog and type in licensing and you'll find a lot more information there. But the thing to note is that we don't enforce licensing. We're not telling you that you must get a license. We're just strongly recommending that you should. And particularly if you want to spend a lot of time, effort and money promoting your station and really making it into a legitimate thing, getting a license can really be the best thing for you. So head to our website, find a bit more information about where you need to go and look into licensing. Prices do vary, but generally, you can expect to pay anywhere from two to three hundred dollars or so a year for a license, but other fees and things can be involved in there. Like I say, licensing on the website will give you a bit more details. We can even put a link to it here if you want to get a direct link of where you need to go. Live broadcasting. What I showed you there and what I touched on incredibly briefly on my demonstration of the platform is pretty much just automated broadcasting. But if you want to go live, you will need to use an additional software, as I teased earlier, called an encoder, or a broadcaster is another name for it. What that basically does is think of it like a middle person software, someone standing in your way, willing to help though. It's connecting you as a host to the platform. So this encoder, so we have one for Windows users called, nicely titled, the, the Radio.co Broadcaster for Windows or if you want to use an alternative one, or if you're using Mac, then BUTT, B-U-T-T, -T, or broadcast you in this tool to use its full name. That's an encoder, and what that does is you will download it, and you will open it up every time you want to go live. You would then, through that, it recognizes that you have logged in to your radio.co station, and you confirm what device you're using, whether it is a mixer, or an interface, or just a USB microphone. Select the right option, and then it means when you do connect for a live broadcast through that piece of software, it knows which audio it should be broadcasting. So your microphone or a headset or a microphone built into your laptop. You just need to use that so it knows where to direct your audio from. So that's for basic broadcasting. 
Foot or our broadcasting tool for Windows. But there are a huge onslaught of other softwares you could use alternatively, such as DJ software like Virtual DJ, Serato, Tractor. They're just a few DJ interfaces that you can use that Think of it, if you will, like a digital mixing board meets a digital turntable. So you can load up tracks, fire them off, obviously talking between them, do whatever you like. You're just managing where they're coming in from. And we actually have help guides on those three I've mentioned and a couple of others as well. So if you want to use an external audio platform for your broadcasting uh, live, then DJ interface software is a way to go. You also may want to consider using external scheduling or automation platform. We always highly recommend using what's available in Radio.co in general. It's much easier to use and we can obviously provide support for it. But if there's a different platform you prefer to use entirely, then you know, you're more than welcome to, as long as it can be connected to Radio.co. And then finally, promotion, marketing. Where on earth can people find your station? Now, I touched on it briefly just before in the you know, internet radio directories, which again, if you want to have a list of them, I'm sure you can find them here. Directories, um, mobile apps, websites, anywhere that you want to plaster your brand and your station to, the better. Because it just means you're opening up how easy and how accessible your station is. The trick with launching any radio station, launching a podcast, launching a video channel, is just making it as easy for people to find, but also as easy for you to direct people to. If you're listed on 30 different directories, that's great. You don't need to direct people to everywhere they can find you, just the most popular ones. You want to give people the easiest chance of Googling something to do with your station, and most of that first page of results is a link to a directory that you're on, a website, an app they can download, or social media profiles, which is really the trick with promoting your online radio station, is again, that just adds to your online visibility. The easier it is for people to find, the more accessible it is for people to eventually listen to and stick around. So my advice is to make yourself available on as many social media platforms as possible. If you don't know how Instagram works, or you're not very good with Twitter or TikTok, what on earth is that, how do I use it? Go out your way to learn that, find out how that works because all these tools are free to use and they see a lot of people use them, millions and millions of people are using every single day. And some of them could potentially find out about your station through this. So don't just stick with Facebook or Twitter because they're the only ones you're familiar with. Go outside your comfort zone, learn how Instagram works. Maybe use some short audio uh, uh, video clips or images to promote people to your station. TikTok is a great way just to promote things that are coming up on your station or doing something funny or do, you know, doing something that just attracts a bit of attention. So be available and across every social media platform you can. Again, you don't need to promote them so heavily. It just increases the likelihood of people finding your station because word of mouth doesn't always work in this internet radio space. And I said it before, people are likely finding out about your station from their mobile phone already. So increase the chances of that happening. Someone is on Facebook. They're also on Twitter and Instagram or um, you know, things like that. So really look into just being across all of that. And that can also come into play with choosing the name of your station. If you haven't come up with a name for your station just yet, or if you recently have, have a look through social media and just see if those Twitter handles, Instagram names, see if they're available to use. If I wanted to use a, uh, my station to be called Phil FM or Phil Radio, ideally I want to be found on Twitter under Phil at Phil Radio. Not at underscore Phil underscore Radio FM. That's a bit too complicated. Not a series random of numbers and letters that no one's really going to get. You want to pick a name that is as straightforward and as direct as possible. So think of that when you are thinking of your station's name before you do get started. And for more information and guidance on promoting and marketing your station, I actually hosted another webinar earlier this year, which you can find on our YouTube channel and of course on our website. And that's me and my colleague Lucy, and we're talking about a lot of tried and tested ways that broadcasters have told us that have worked for them, whether that is through word of mouth, through being available at events, through using social media. So if you want tips on great ways to just try and make your station available and successful in the marketing space, find that webinar and uh, yeah, I'm sure you'll find that really helpful.
And finally, here are a few frequently asked questions that are sent to me on an almost daily basis, sure to clarify those last couple of doubts and niggles in the back of your mind. First of all, does Radio.co provide music for us to play? No, unfortunately. Any content, music or otherwise, that you want to play must be sourced by yourself. We do have a few recommendations of places you could go, uh, however. So for music, I like music. It's a great site to get some really uh, crystal clear broadcast quality content on your station and they charge very well for it. But generally for music, any any MP3 files you have, whether you've ripped them from a CD or you know, you've bought them from Amazon or iTunes in the past, as long as they're MP3s, upload them. So unfortunately we don't have a library for you to use. Royalty free music, again we have recommendations of where to go there and also lots of other services that provide music for DJs and things. But yeah, ultimately everything you want to play must be provided by you. Can I curse and broadcast whenever I want? I mean, if you want to, absolutely. I mean, with Radio.co, it's a bit lawless in the sense that there's no overlord, no jurisdiction overlooking online radio, not like uh, the FCC or Ofcom and things like that. So you can actually pretty much broadcast whatever you want within reason, of course. So if you do want to curse and, you know, talk about, uh, you know, curse primarily, then absolutely. If you want to play music with foul language, absolutely. It's just worth considering if you are trying to promote a community station or if you are trying to attract uh, sponsors, uh, businesses for advertising, they may not be accustomed to uh, any foul language you want. But yeah, you know, if you, you, you can literally broadcast whatever you like and however you want. We're not there to tell you whether you can swear or not. So, uh, you know, we do have some basic terms and conditions for some content and you can find those by scrolling right to the bottom of our Radio.co website. Can my radio shows be listened to on demand? Yes, but not directly through radio.co. On demand broadcasting is, if anything, just as popular as live uh, radio broadcasting. It just gives people a second chance to catch a show that they may have missed live. Fundamentally, you want to make a big deal of people listening to shows live because they could potentially get involved with it. But of course, not everyone is available at the time that you want them to. So. Turning your shows into on-demand content is a great way of doing that. The live recording feature that we have within Radio.co will allow you to record a live show and then instantly upload it to Mixcloud or Podcast.co, our sister company. So they are great places to make on-demand content available to your audience because they, uh, especially through Podcast.co, which could then be available across Spotify. Apple Podcasts, TuneIn Podcasts even. So it's something to consider. You know, some people think, do I need to do a radio station or do I need to do a podcast? It should be, which one do I want to do first? You should really combine them both. So yes, absolutely make your radio shows available on demand. You just need an adjacent platform alongside radio.co to do it, like podcast.co. Does my station have to be 24-7? Absolutely not. As I mentioned before, you are free to run your station in whatever fashion you like. So you can turn your station on and off anytime you want to. And indeed, a lot of people do actually just broadcast once a day, once a week even. If that's the way you want to do things, absolutely. If you just want to do a live podcast once a week, this platform's perfect for doing that. And you may just want to turn your station on and off once a week. Otherwise, by default, it is 24 seven. Turn it off whenever you like. So yeah, rest easy, you know, we've got those programming tools, that default playlist that will fill those gaps in for you. But yeah, absolutely do whatever you like. Is it possible to monetize my Radio.co station? Absolutely. Although to be honest, it can take a lot of time and effort to actually get there, time especially. So currently at time of recording, we don't have any tools or features that help with the monetization of anything. So if you do want to make money on your radio station, you need to go out and arrange that yourself. But that could just be a case of approaching local businesses and getting them to create ads for you or you create ads for them, uploading them, building them into playlists and just away you go. So absolutely monetize your radio station. And because we have no uh, interference, no belonging in your monetization efforts, you keep all revenue that you make. So, you know, because of that, you're all 100% of any business you make is absolutely yours. We don't see any of that. It's also a good tip is if you want to make a business or a brand's uh, identity available across your station, a great way of doing that is getting them to sponsor shows because on your web players that are plastered on your apps or your website, you can have custom artwork for each individual show. 
If a business has sponsored your breakfast show, then throughout the entirety of that breakfast show, you could have an image of their business through it. It's a great way to get publicity. So absolutely monetize your station in any fashion uh, you want, you know, through affiliate links, you know, through bits of equipment that you're using, uh, donation buttons available on your website, put your radio station behind a paywall if you want. And our founder, James, has actually done a great video on our Radio.co channel and indeed a few on his own James Mulvaney YouTube channel uh, about different ways, tried and tested ways of making money for your station. So I do recommend checking those out just for more essential tips. And finally, can I contact Radio.co whenever I need help? Yes, if this wasn't enough of a cheeky plug for our services, absolutely. So as well as the software, which you know we're a software company first and foremost, we are also passionate and enthusiastic about broadcasting. So if there's anything we can do to really elevate and help you broadcast, we're here for it. That doesn't just mean technical support, which of course you will have in spades. So if you are struggling with something, something's not working, you need to familiarize yourself with things. Of course, we have tutorials and guides like the one I've just done available. If you just want to speak to someone, send us an email and we'll help in any way possible. Um, so yeah, we're here to help any step of the way, holding your hand till you're really confident and happy about broadcasting. But we're also here just for general guidance. I feel I've hopefully at least giving you some good uh, things to chew on but uh, you know if you want advice on promoting writing scripts how to create jingles how to improve your presenting skills all that's available on our website and from our passionate enthusiastic brains for broadcasting so get in touch with us via studio at radio.co if you have any questions about your station or just a bit of advice on how to really elevate it to the next level of course, they are just a selection of the most commonly asked questions that I find every week. So of course, if yours wasn't answered, then please email them over to studio at radio.co and I'll help as soon as I possibly can. Well, there we have it. In no time at all, as promised, I've discussed basic equipment to source, demonstrated the software to use, and answered a few burning questions along the way. So trust me when I say that you can literally begin broadcasting in just a few short minutes. Sure, you'll want to spend time getting all your ducks in a row, like getting content ready, looking into licensing, buying equipment, all that jazz. But once that's all in place, all it takes is a Radio.co subscription and you'll be on air before the day is through. Now, if you'd like to chat with myself and the team about your radio station plans, any further questions, or if you'd just like a one-to-one -one demonstration of everything Radio.co can do specifically for your station, then head to our website, radio.co forward slash demo, or click at the top of the page here. In the meantime, if there's anything I can do to help you begin broadcasting, I'm only an email away. And that email address, once again, is studio at radio.co. Thanks for joining me for this webinar. I hope you found it useful and along the way you may have enjoyed it. And until next time, take care and happy broadcasting. And just before you go, how would you like to launch your very own online radio station? Surprisingly, it's a lot simpler than you may think. And the absolute best way to get started is by chatting to myself or another member of the Radio.co team. To do that, just head to radio.co forward slash demo to schedule a video call with us, where we'll discuss your plans, answer your questions, and of course, guide you around the Radio.co software. <laughs>